This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And I'd like to tell you about something Dr. Watson shared with me the other night. Some Petri California sherry. Did you ever have a glass of Petri sherry before dinner? Well, that's a swell time for it, because that Petri sherry is the best beginning a good meal ever had. What a wine. You don't have to serve it in fancy wine glasses, either. Not Petri sherry. That wine would taste wonderful if you drank it out of a water glass. You can just taste those sun-ripened grapes. And incidentally, if you like your sherry dry, you know, not sweet then just do what I do. As for Petri Pale Dry Sherry. It's a good idea to always have a bottle of Petri Sherry in the house because it's just the thing to serve when company catches you unprepared. And believe me, you can serve that Petri Sherry proudly because it's a fact that the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wines. And now let's visit with our good friend, Dr. Watson. I know he's expecting us. Oh, good evening, Mr. Bartell. Evening, Doctor. Oh, you have the old black tin dispatch box out again, I Yes, think. my boy. I've just been refreshing my memory on one or two points in connection with tonight's story. Uh, draw up a chair. Thanks. That's it, that's it. The tobacco's in the jar beside you. Thanks, Doctor. Uh, you know, I'm particularly excited about hearing your story tonight. Uh, last week, you told us that Sherlock Holmes' brother, Mycroft Holmes, took part in the adventure. That's quite right, Mr. Bartell. <laughs> I didn't even know Mr. Holmes had a brother. I wish you'd tell me something about him. Well, Mycroft was seven years older than Sherlock, but the difference between them was amazing. While Holmes was lean and consumed with a burning energy, his elder brother was fat and lazy. And yet Holmes has often told me that Mycroft was his superior in powers of observation and deduction. Well, now that you've thoroughly whetted my appetite, Doctor, how's about it? Very well, my boy. I suppose this story really began in Mycroft Holmes' room at the Foreign Office in London. Although I've said he was a lazy man, he did hold a position of considerable importance. In fact, you may remember that on more than one occasion, Holmes has said, Mycroft is the British government. But uh, to get back to my story. It's on a June morning in 1912, just before the First World War, that a young man in the foreign office named Guy Travers stood talking to Mycroft Holmes, who sat sprawled in an armchair before him, his feet resting on another chair... His cupped hands, cradling his ample stump. Mr. Holmes. I say, Mr. Holmes, you haven't gone to sleep, have you, sir? No, Travers, I'm not asleep. I'm just waiting for you to get to the point. Well, sir, the point is that I'm on the track of a most elusive female spy. Dear me, how exhausting. She's dangerous, sir, very dangerous. She's not only a collector of information, but a sort of central clearinghouse of military secrets as well. You seem to be a little young, Travers, to be on such a case. I asked for the assignment, sir. Why? Female spies aren't as glamorous as they sound, you know. No one knows that better than I do, sir. You see, my brother got mixed up with this girl two years ago. He was cashiered from his regiment and committed suicide. I'm sorry, Travers. Tell me what you found out about her. You say you've been on her track? I've traced her to a number of seaside towns, but she keeps slipping through my fingers. Have you a list of the towns? Yes, sir. Here you are. No, no, no. You read them to me. Well, I first got on her track at Torquay... From there, I trailed her to Weymouth, Bournemouth, Portsmouth, Bognor, Worthing, Hove, Brighton, and... Uh... I trust you drew the obvious conclusion. I think I did, sir. Several of those towns are naval bases. No, no, no. The list you've just read me is a recognized theatrical circuit. Oh, uh, I never thought of that. The simplest way to track down your spy is to find whether she was appearing in either a play or variety act in all of the towns on the dates covered by your inquiries. Yes, Mr. Holmes, I'll do that at once, and then I'll report back to you. Oh, very well, if you must. Uh, close the door quietly, won't you? I'm confoundedly sleepy. Mr. Holmes? Mr. Holmes, you haven't gone to sleep again, have you, sir? Oh, it's you, Travers. Well, <coughs> what did you find out? A great deal, sir. 
The only theatrical show that was appearing at all of those towns was a magician's act called The Great Gandolfo. I trust you went and saw the performance. Yes, sir. Last night at Hastings. And? The magician's assistant was a girl who looked exactly like the one I saw my brother with two years ago. Did you go backstage and talk to her? Yes, sir. But it's a funny thing. For though she looked exactly like the other girl, I swear she isn't the same one. This girl seemed utterly charming and sincere when she told me she'd never heard of my brother. Hmm, that's the danger of putting you young fellows on a case of this kind. A beautiful woman and a good actress can fool you nine times out of ten. What's your next move, Travers? Well, sir, I was hoping perhaps... Perhaps you might come down with me and see the act. It's playing at Eastbourne tomorrow. It's not very far, sir. Stir my twenty stone. <laughs> leave, leave the comforts of my office and club to track a spy. No, my boy. However, your mention of Eastbourne gives me an idea. Yes, sir. My young brother Sherlock is living on a bee farm a few miles outside Eastbourne. He might help you. He's a great detective, isn't he, sir? I have never regarded him as one. Though I will admit that for a man with such a shocking excess of physical energy, he possesses a relatively superior mind. Yes, yes, go and ask Sherlock. Thank you, sir, I will. <laughs> Tell him that if, uh, if he can't solve the case, I'll do it for him. And without leaving London. <laughs> And so, Mr. Holmes, I did as your brother suggested and came down here to Eastbourne to tell you about the case. I quite understand, Mr. Travers. Very interesting story it is, too, my boy. I'm certainly glad that I happen to be staying down here with you, Holmes. Uh, you will handle the case, of course. I'm undecided, old fellow. The problem presents some interesting possibilities, and yet my life here among the bees has taken on a pleasant and soothing pattern. Oh, I... I hate to disturb oh, it. Oh, come, 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 Holmes. It'll be good for you to get away from your wretched bees for a few days. I forgot to tell you, Mr. Holmes. As I left your brother, he told me that if you couldn't solve the case, he'd do it for you without <laughs> leaving London. <laughs> Dear old Mycroft, he meant that as a challenge. Hand me the paper, will you, Watson? Uh, yeah. Thanks, old chap. Well, what are you looking for? The amusement guide. Ah, here it is. Devonshire Theatre, Eastbourne, twice, nightly variety, 6.30 and 9, the great Gandolfo, King of Magic. You mean you'll come to the theatre with me tonight, Mr. Holmes? Certainly. I can't allow Mycroft's challenge to go unanswered, and I'm sure that Dr. Watson will accompany us when I tell him Miss Sissy Gitana is also appearing on the bill singing, an old favourite of his. There was I waiting at the church, waiting at the church, waiting at the church. Entertaining woman, Sissy Katana. <laughs> and that's good looking, too. My wife will let me. <laughs> the great Gandolfo is next, Mr. Holmes. Yes, I'm just studying the program. Ha <laughs> ha ha. He's not exactly modest in his claims, is he? The great Gandolfo, the world staggering illusionist. Presenting the ceiling cabinet mystery assisted by Miss Florine Lassour. Oh, dear me, how very florid. I must say, I love this old music hall flavor. I remember going to the Palace Theatre a few years ago to see a perfectly charming girl who wore a white dress that made her look like a little white rabbit. <laughs> that dress did look frightfully becoming, I must say. I sent my card round the stage door with some flowers, of course, but to my amazement... That's a fascinating yet... story, old fellow, huh? but I'm afraid you'll have to finish it later. The curtain's oh, going up. But... <laughs> there he is. That's the great Gandolfo. By Joe, this assistant's very attractive, isn't she? Listen. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to be here before you tonight. I may say that the ceiling cabinet mystery that I am about to present has entertained and perplexed half a dozen of the crown kings of Europe uh, together with their queen. Come, don't talk so much. Get on with the trick. <laughs> <laughs> and I may say, I'm hoping that you, ladies and gentlemen, will give me the same courtesy and attention that was given me by the royalty I have just mentioned. Now, before I present my illusion. I should like to ask for two volunteers from the audience who will come up here beside me on the stage so that I may be watched. Uh, two, uh, two volunteers, please. Uh, wait for us here, Mr. Travers. Very well, Mr. Holmes. Come on, Watson. You mean that we're going up on the stage? Yes, it's a wonderful opportunity. Do I see two gentlemen rising? Splendid. 
Two gentlemen are coming up from the audience. Two gentlemen that I have never seen before. Watch the step, please. That's it. Over the footlights and onto the stage. That's right. And now, sir, have you uh, ever seen me before? Never. And uh, you, sir? Mm. Don't be afraid to speak up, sir. No, I haven't. <laughs> uh, Mr. Sewer, please see that the gentlemen are seated. I thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to watch me closely. You will observe that there is a wooden cabinet on the stage. There is also another cabinet of the same shape and size hanging high above me, which uh, you can all, all see. Um, a glass of water, please, Mr. Sewer. Oh, go on. Put a stock in it. <laughs> what did you say, sir? You heard you ain't got claw for you. <laughs> we will dispense with the glass of water. Now, my assistant, Miss Florine Lasseur, will step into this cabinet on the stage. I want you two gentlemen to watch very closely. Miss Lasseur is now lying inside the cabinet. Is she not? Yes, she is. Uh, very well. I close the lid. So, I uh, lock it with these bolts. And now, I ask one of you gentlemen to attach this uh, padlock to the box. Uh, you, sir. Will you oblige me? Very well. I thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, before your eyes you have seen Mr. Sewer enter a cabinet on this stage. A cabinet that has been bolted and padlocked. You can still see the duplicate cabinet hanging above me by an attachment of wires and pulleys. I now count a one, a two, a three, and fire this revolver at the cabinet above me. Now, if you two gentlemen will kindly help me, we will lower the ceiling cabinet to the stage. You will notice that this cabinet is also bolted and padlocked. I will ask one of you two gentlemen to unbolt it. I thank you, sir. And to this gentleman, I shall hand the key of the padlock. Uh, kindly unlock it, sir. I thank you. And now, if you will both raise the lid of the cabinet. And here, ladies and gentlemen, is Miss Florine Lasseur. <laughs> Why did we have to leave, Holmes? I was, I was having a wonderful time. Sorry to drag you away, but there's work to be done. Mr. Holmes, if you want to go backstage, I'll introduce you to Miss Lasseur. Oh, that's a splendid idea. But before we do that, Mr. Travers, there's one important fact I want to know. What is it, sir? I presume you have a dossier of the available facts concerning this spy? Yes, sir, everything that we've been able to find out. Uh, among that evidence, do you by any chance have any fingerprint records? Yes, sir, I do. Splendid. Then let's go at once to the nearest police station and compare the fingerprints on this glass with those in your possession. Where did you get that glass, Holmes? You remember that Miss Lasseur, before she entered that cabinet on the stage, handed Gandolfo a glass of water. You mean that's the glass? Why else should I be carrying a drinking glass with me, old chap? Hmm, very neat, Mr. Holmes, and right under the nose of a magician, too. Well, I'm not exactly inept at the practice of... Uh... Leisure domain myself, Mr. Travers. Come on, let's have a talk with that local fingerprint expert, shall we? Mr. Holmes, the fingerprints on this glass you brought me are not the same as the one shown in this record. You're positive? Oh, absolutely, sir. Just as I thought. I'm much obliged to you. Always glad to help a gentleman like you, Mr. Holmes. Thank you and good night. Come on, Travers. Watson? I wish you'd explain what you're up to, Holmes. So do I, sir. I'm completely in the dark. Surely it's obvious. The only way Gandalfo's trick could be done is by using twin girls, dressed identically, of course. One in the cabinet on the stage and the other in the cabinet hanging from the ceiling. I don't know whether you noticed it, Watson, but there were some small holes drilled around the base of the box, undoubtedly, to enable its occupant to breathe. By George, of course. That would explain why the girl I spoke to didn't seem to know me, or my brother when I spoke of him. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And in any case, how better could a spy hide herself from a role where her employer, a magician, must, by the very nature of his trick, deny her existence? The question is, which girl is the spy? This fingerprint test has given us the answer. You mean it isn't the girl on the stage, the one who assisted Gandolfo? It certainly is not, old fellow. Your spy will be in the cabinet, suspended high above the stage of the Devonshire Theatre at nine o'clock this evening. But this time, we will watch the performance from the audience. <laughs> Watch 
me closely, ladies and gentlemen. There is no deception. A one, a two, a three. And now, if you two gentlemen will kindly help me, we will untie the ropes and lower the ceiling cabinet to the stage. Holmes, we, we must never get away. Don't worry, old chap. But keep your eyes skinned. You may have a surprise for us. And I will now ask one of you two gentlemen to unbolt the cabinet. I thank you, sir. And now, if this gentleman will take the key and unlock the padlock, I thank you, sir. And now, if you will both raise the lid of the cabinet, I thank you. And here, ladies and gentlemen, is Miss Florine Lasseur. Mr. Sewer, step out, please. Mr. Sewer, bring down the curtain. It's been an accident. Come on, Watson. Let's get up on the stage. Right, Sherlock Holmes. What happened, sir? It's Miss Lasseur. She's been injured. I'm a doctor. Let me look at her. I'm afraid she's beyond the help of doctors, Watson. Look at that bullet wound in her head. She has been murdered. We'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a few seconds, so I'm just going to make a very quick suggestion. If you like good food, who doesn't, you'll find that good food always tastes better when accompanied by a good glass of Petri wine. And Petri makes wonderful mealtime wines. If you like a red wine, you know, to go with any meat or meat dish, you really like Petri California Burgundy. And if you prefer a white wine to go with chicken or fish, you couldn't ask for a better one than Petri California Sauternes. Remember those two wines, huh? Petri Burgundy and Petri Sautern. They're Petri wines, so you know they're good. And now back to Dr. Watson and tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure, The Great Gandolfo. What happened next, Doctor? You just got to the part where you and Sherlock Holmes on, on the stage of a vaudeville theater... We're examining the dead body of one of the great Gandolfo's assistants. That's right, my boy. As you can imagine, the excitement was intense. The local police were soon at the theater, and the officer in charge, a certain Sergeant Buff, seemed to take a very great personal dislike to Sherlock Holmes. So the great Sherlock Holmes comes out of retirement to teach our police force how to handle a case, doesn't he? Sergeant Buff, you're being ridiculous. I'm not trying to teach the police anything. You follow your own line of investigation and I'll follow mine. And supposing I say I don't want private detectives poking their nose into a police investigation. <laughs> then, my good man, I shall report your conduct to the local chief of police and obtain the necessary permission. Uh, no need to get uppity about it, Mr. Holmes, but too many cooks spoil the broth, you know. Oh, an extremely profound remark, Sergeant. And now, if you'll excuse me, I've work to do. And so have I. And we'll see who gets to the bottom of this first. I'm going to Condolfo's dressing room. Holmes, I'm worried about the dead girl's twin sister. I've been looking for her everywhere, and no one seems to have seen her since the tragedy occurred. Naturally, my dear chap, you would hardly expect her to reveal the secret of the cabinet trick by exposing the fact that the uh, dead girl had a twin. I never thought of that. But we saw her there on the stage when the trick started. It seems to me that she's in great danger. She is in very great danger. Now, don't worry. I've taken the precaution of having her guarded. Oh, how? Oh, oh. I'll explain that to you later. In the meantime, we have to work fast. It appears that Sergeant Buff is out to try and show me up by uh, solving the case first. That makes the second challenge I've received today. Well, Mr. Holmes, and how are you getting along? Splendidly, thanks. And you? I'm beaten, I don't mind admitting it. I thought at first the one man it couldn't be was Gandolfo because he was on the stage all the time. But then it seemed to me that he might have fired a live bullet when he shot at the box on the ceiling. The angle from the stage wouldn't coincide with the bullet hole in the bottom of the box, Sergeant. That shot must have been fired from the audience below. Uh, Mr. Holmes, uh, you know who did it, don't you? Yes, Sergeant, I do. Uh, I I wish you'd tell me, Mr. Holmes. It should be obvious, Sergeant. Watson, you examined the corpse. Please tell the sergeant your findings. The girl was lying on her back in the box. There was a small hole in her forehead and a large one in the nape of her neck. Exactly. And since the point of entrance of a bullet is smaller than the point of exit, it proves that she must have been shot lying in the box from above. Once the box was in position over the audience, 
Uh, she could have been shot only from below. Therefore, the girl had already been killed when the box was hoisted to the ceiling. By Joe, yes. And only one person could have done that. Only two. Oh, how do you figure that out, Mr. Holmes? The dead girl's sister had the same opportunity as the great Gandolfo himself. Of course she had. Uh, now I see why you were having her watched, Mr. Holmes. And if you'll excuse me saying so, sir, I begin to think it's a good thing you're on this case after all. <laughs> oh, that's very generous of you, Sergeant. And now perhaps if you, uh... You'll do me the favor of keeping an eye on Mr. Gandolfo yourself? Uh, of course I will, sir. Where are we going, Holmes? To the Jolly Fisherman Hotel to call on Miss Lasseur. How do you know she's there? I just received a message from young Travers. He followed her on my instructions as she left the theater. Come on, old chap. There's no time to be lost. <laughs> Ah, there you are, Travers. Miss Lasseur is still here, I trust. Yes, Mr. Holmes. She's up in her room. I wonder if you'd mind asking her to come down and see me. I'm sure that we can talk privately in the lounge over there. Right you are, Mr. Holmes. I'll go and get her. What are you going to say to Miss Lasseur, Holmes? That depends on her attitude, old chap. Come on. Let's go into the lounge, shall we? Oh, it's a lucky thing that you had her followed. It was an obvious precaution, Watson. You see, I realized from the very nature of the cabinet trick that Miss Lasseur would have to leave the theater... After escaping through the trap door below the cabinet uh, that was on the stage, before her twin sister descended from the cabinet that was su suspended from the ceiling. And she doesn't know that her sister's been murdered, huh? If she is innocent, she doesn't. And if she is innocent, then we'll know that our murderer is Gandolfo. Shh. Here she comes. I've told Miss Lassure that you want to talk to her privately, Mr. Holmes. If it's the act you want to talk about, Mr. Holmes, I've nothing to say. Magicians have a code of honor, you know. I quite appreciate that fact, Miss Lassure. Won't you sit down? What do you want with me? I have news for you. News of your twin sister. My... I haven't got a twin sister. My friend knows exactly how the cabinet trick is done, my dear young lady. Yes, you might as well tell the truth, Miss Lasseur. Well, all right then, so I have a twin sister. What of it? No crime in that, is there? What are you getting at? I want you to believe that I'm here to help you, my dear. You're going to need help and courage. What are you getting at? Look, come on, tell me. I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news. Miss Lasseur, your sister is dead. Dead? Huh. I don't believe it. I'm afraid it's true. She was murdered. You're lying. This is a trick. You're trying to make me give myself away. I'm trying to get at the truth. Your sister was found shot through the head when the cabinet was lowered to the stage tonight. I, I still don't believe it. Why should my friend lie to you? How was your sister the last time you saw her? for the commencement of the act. No different from any other time? Who was responsible for superintending her entry into the cabinet? Gandolfo, or me. She used to go into it before the performance, when the stage was dark and deserted. Did you help her enter the box tonight? No. Gandolfo did. You knew, of course, of your sister's activities. How do you mean? That she was engaged in espionage. That's not true. Very well, Mr. Lassau. If you won't be honest with me, I'm afraid I'll have to turn you over to the police. I think you'll find their methods are a little more crude than mine, though. The, the police? Oh, no. No, don't do that, Mr. Holmes. All right, I'll tell you everything. Gandolfo got me so frightened of him. I was lying to you. I knew that my sister was working for him. I tried to stop her, but she loved money. And Gandolfo gave her plenty of that. They had a row before the show tonight. She knew you were on the stage at the first performance, Mr. Holmes. Gandolfo had spotted you, too. She was frightened. Said she knew you'd catch her and she wanted to run away. Gandolfo told her that she had to appear tonight. And they were still arguing about it when they left the dressing room. The dirty swine killed her because he was afraid she'd give him away. And now he'll kill me, too! Don't worry, my dear. The great Gandolfo will be beyond the help of magic before this night is out. Yes, he'll be behind bars where he belongs. Travers. Yes, sir. And stay here with Miss Lasseur, will you? We'll be back later. At the moment, there is unfinished business awaiting us at the Devonshire Theatre. <laughs> Well, Mr. Holmes, I can't tell you how grateful I am. Gandolfo's safely in prison, thanks to you, and now you tell me you don't want no credit in the case. Oh, my dear sergeant. I'm really a bee farmer, you know. In any case, I want to restore your faith in private detectives. The next time you meet one, I'm, I, I'm sure you won't be so, um, uh, so unfriendly, shall I say? Uh, I, I'm humble, sir. I, I'm very humble, and, and I thank you very kindly for all you've done. Oh, and uh, uh, by the way, Mr. Holmes, uh, this telegram arrived for you at the theater uh, while you were away, and here you are, sir. Oh, thank you, Sergeant Buck. Uh, no, sir, it's, 
me that should be thanking you, sir. Who on earth knew that you were at the theater tonight? And you'll soon find out. Well, what does it say, Holmes? <laughs> it's from my brother, Mycroft. Mycroft? What's he got to say? Oh, really, it's quite humiliating. That's all he said he hadn't, uh, he wouldn't have to, and he ne never did leave his armchair in London. Listen to this. Have just checked on Gandolfo's repertoire of magic tricks. You will find spy in box suspended from ceiling of theater. Elementary, eh, my dear Sherlock? <laughs> Joe Holmes, he, he really is amazing, isn't he? <laughs> he is also a prophet, old chap. Prophet? How do you mean? Well, he indicates the handwriting on the wall. I'm past my prime. I'm too old for alert detection. It's back to me bee farm, old fellow. It's back to me bees. <laughs> Doctor, that was a swell story. I bet it was an interesting case to work on. Yes, it certainly was. I've always had a fancy for the theater, you know. <laughs> what you really mean, Doctor, is you always had an eye for a pretty girl. <laughs> Mr. Bartell, you're a very blunt fellow. <laughs> Why blunt. not? I must admit, I like to look at a pretty girl myself. You, Mr. Bartell? Why shouldn't I like to look at a pretty girl? Oh, go right ahead and look, my dear fellow. Go right ahead. You just sort of surprised me a bit, that's all. I never thought you gave a moment's consideration to anything but pet rewind. <laughs> now you're really pulling my leg. <laughs> I must admit, I do talk a lot about pet rewind, but after all, Doctor, it's worth talking about. What other wine has such tradition, such a story behind it? Pet rewind is made by a family, the Petri family. They've owned and run their own business ever since its inception, back in the 1800s. The Petri family's been making good wine for generations, and they've been handing on down in the family from father to son from father to son, the fine art of turning luscious, sun-ripened grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. And that sure adds up to a lot of experience. You can just bet your last dollar that no matter what kind of wine you want, when you ask for a Petri wine, you're asking for good wine. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. How's about giving us a clue to next week's Sherlock Holmes adventure? Well, no, uh... Next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you a most unusual story that took place aboard a small steamship as it plowed through the stormy seas of the Indian Ocean. I call the adventure Murder by Moonlight. Oh, uh, before I say good night, ladies and gentlemen, remember that on Saturday, October the 27th, the nation will observe Navy Day. This is your opportunity to thank your fleet for its magnificent contribution towards victory. Don't forget, will you? Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Second Stain. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.